So my name is Carmen Bold. I'm the oral historian at William & Mary. It's currently around 9 a.m. on June 2nd, 2018. I'm sitting in the Kempton Hotel Allegro in Chicago, Illinois with Catherine Healy, class of 2007. So we're gonna start out. Um, could you tell me the date and place of your birth and what years you attended William & Mary? So I was born November 4th, 1985 in Salt Lake City, Utah. And then, okay, what was the last question? Oh, yeah, and what years, years you attended William, William Mary? 2003 to 2007. Okay, great. And then also for grad school from okay. 2010 to 2012. Awesome. And can you tell me a little bit about where and how you were raised? Were you raised in Salt Lake City? I was not. Okay. So my parents divorced when I was three. My mom moved to Richmond, Virginia, because that's where her sister was, and my grandparents lived in D.C. at the time. So I was pretty much, I would say, born and raised in Richmond, Virginia my mm -hmm. whole life. Great. Um, Yes. And can you tell me a little bit more just about your family dynamic, maybe what your parents did for a living? Sure. So my mom was a teacher mm -hmm. and my dad is a CPA and my stepfather's also a CPA and my stepmom's an attorney. So I kind of had the whole modern family um, situation before the whole modern family was kind of the cool thing. So yeah. that's how I grew up. So my parents, my dad lived in Salt Lake City and then my mom lived in Richmond. And so I would spend my summers going out to Salt Lake City and staying with my dad. Um, the summer and so that was kind of an interesting dynamic to have growing up. Oh, I'm sure. So when did you start thinking about college then? I probably started thinking about college pretty early just because I think my dad was kind of like not brainwashing me but I definitely think he wanted me to come out west mm -hmm. and just experience that so he took me to college campuses I think around my sophomore year. So I went to Cal Berkeley, I remember going to Stanford, uh, University of Utah, I looked at, because that's actually how my parents met, so my mom went to University of Utah. Um, so she was, she was okay with that, I think. But then, you know, my, living in Richmond mm -hmm. and Virginia, we have such good schools in state, you know, William & Mary obviously being one of them, UVA, JMU. Mm -hmm. So I ended up looking at all of those as well. And probably around my sophomore year, I started to get interested in that. Okay, and so William & Mary got on your radar because it was one of those in-state schools that yep. you started looking at, but what in particular drew you to it? So I would say in high school I was actually pretty a lost person. I was like, I don't know where I want to go because of that dynamic that my parents were both like, well, you have the opportunity to go wherever you want. Mm -hmm. I think that kind of was like very difficult. Sure. I wish someone would have just said, no, like you need to go here. This is where you belong. And that just kind of never transpired. And I think what happened was in 2001 was September 11th. Mm -hmm. And that for me was like, okay, I need to stay close to home. I want to be near my parents. I don't want to be getting on planes anymore. Mm -hmm. Like this is not, I think that had a big, you know, impact on me. Mm -hmm. And so I ended up looking at William & Mary by proximity just because it's an hour from Richmond. Yeah. And it's so good and, you know, small. I was like, maybe I do want the small feel. And when it came down to it, I was really torn between William and & Mary and UVA. Mm -hmm. And so I spent, you know, a lot of time looking at both of those schools. I did like back-to-back -back weekends there because I got into both. And so I was like, okay, I'm gonna go to UVA for a weekend and stay here and stay with this girl that I know. So I went there, I stayed with her, and I was like, oh, I love it here. The school's so beautiful. These people are so fun. They're so smart. I think I wanna come here. Then my next weekend was William and Mary, and I was like, oh, but I love William and Mary. These people are so down to earth. Mm -hmm. They're so normal. They're so great. It's so small. And I felt like the girl that I stayed with, um, her name was Amanda. She let me stay with her in her Yates, Yates Hall. And I felt like she knew everybody, and she, it was like, hi, Amanda, hi, Amanda. And I was like, how does she know everybody? You know, and so for me, I was like, okay, I really like that small town feel. I think I want this. Okay. Um, and so that, that's kind of how I, you know, was drawn to it, sure. just by having those experiences. Yeah, and so can we talk a little bit more about just your first experiences on campus, be that when you visited after you were accepted or even your first week as a freshman, just what that was like, what it looked like, felt like, smelled like, I don't know. Yeah, sure. So I think the visit for me, back to that, mm -hmm. like I said, I felt like she just knew everybody and we went to some, we went to like a drama class or something, some play. And again, she just knew everybody. Mm -hmm. And so I was, I liked that. And then when I arrived myself, I'm, I'm thinking back then, so that was 2003, I remember coming for moving day and it was so hot. It was like those muggy, Williamsburg days and my parents are like unloading the car and you just see everybody's like drenched mm -hmm. in sweat. Um, I lived in DuPont which was um, I think that's exactly where I wanted to be because it was co-ed. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to be in Barrett which I had some friends there who also loved their experience um, and my roommate at the time was from Minnesota. 
And so she was my roommate, her name's Renee. We were roommates for all four years of college, which is kind of crazy yeah. that that happened, but that's how it worked. Um, and so move-in day, I just remember, you know, unloading the van or car. Renee was there, we met her parents, my parents met her, and it was sort of like, I don't know, just this weird moment, like, okay, you guys are here together, you're gonna have a fun adventure, see you later. Um, and I, you said like the sounds, the smells, just, it was hot, that's what, and I remember just being sweaty, and I remember seeing like the line of people going into DuPont to like sign in that you're there and you're moving in, and I just remember seeing everybody and thinking, like this is so cool, These I don't know a single person. I also was the only person from my high school to go, which when I think about, like when I look back at that, I went to a school of 1,200 kids, and so my class was 400, and we all lived an hour from William and Mary, and I was the only one who Unusual. went. Yeah. So I kind of liked that though. I was like, I don't know anybody, this is cool, I have a fresh start from high school, I get to be my own person, I get to do whatever I want, this is awesome. So I went in very positive and optimistic. Um, and within my first like month or so, I did join a sorority. So I joined Kappa Kappa Gamma and went through that whole like rush process and saw how that all worked. And you know, that was so much fun. It, it was new, it was exciting. I got to meet a lot of people in like a very short amount of time. Um, and then I also remember, well, this was, I was thinking about that this week, like, what do I remember, like, the big events happening? So about three weeks in, and, like, right after Rush, or maybe around the same time, Hurricane Isabel came through, and everybody had to evacuate, we all had to leave, and that, it was like we had just started, we had just started classes, we were just getting to know people, and I was like, oh, you're gone for two weeks, I think it might have even been three. It was a long, it was a long break where we went home and I was like, okay, I'm back home with my parents again. Like, what happened to the new friends I had? I had like a fun little independent stint for a minute and now I'm back home. So I do remember that. And I remember I had to leave like my fish in the dorm and I was like, oh my gosh, I hope my fish is not dead in there. He ended up being alive. He was like the survivor it's fish. Miraculous. Yes. Um, so yeah, the, yeah, that was kind of the first like tumultuous start to William and Mary for oh sure. Goodness, it sounds like it. Yeah, that's wild. <laughs> do you know? where everyone went so you were in close proximity to home yep. but where was everyone else sent yeah. like students who were not local exactly and like they were canceling flights and stuff right. so people couldn't get out exactly yeah, so my roommate she went with another girl on our hall okay um and it's actually funny you bring this up because this was something else i was thinking about just how william and mary kind of opened my eyes to so many things so this girl on our hall renee went with her on her like private jet down to Myrtle Beach or so, some area down south. And I just remember thinking like, how in the world does she have a private jet and like, where am I? Because I grew up in Midlothian, Virginia, mm -hmm. suburb outside of Richmond, very, I would say I grew up pretty middle class. Mm -hmm. I mean, I had never seen anything like that or been around that type of money before. And so joining a sorority, the girls on my hall and like just starting to see that there were people out there who had a lot of money that were at William and Mary. So I think that's funny, like I was starting to think that and that's exactly what happened. So she went with her, um, another girl that was on my hall from Texas went with her roommate down to North Carolina. So it seems like people kind of paired up yeah. and went, and like of course I offered, I was like anyone's welcome to come with me, like I live an hour away, it's totally fine. But I think everybody paired up and kind of did their own things and a lot of people were in state so yeah. they did just go home too. Oh my goodness, well that is wild. That is a really quick way to disrupt a freshman experience. <laughs> it's like, welcome, start classes, meet friends, okay, bye. Like, come back and Go two, home for three weeks. Two and a half weeks. It, it was crazy because uh, the campus was so destroyed too. Yeah. Like I remember coming back and DuPont, there were like trees down and I mean, things had been damaged, so okay. for sure. And they didn't want anyone coming on campus and getting hurt oh, sure. by like a fallen limb or mm -hmm. you know something, so. That's wild. Exactly, it was crazy. Oh my goodness. So we'll get into some of the other memories you have of William Mary because I want to hear about all of them. But um, let's go back to what you chose to study and if you knew what you wanted to study going into college. That is, I knew that question was going to come. I had a <laughs> feeling. And so I started to think about that. Um, so going in, I had thought I wanted to do international relations mm -hmm. or history or something um, along that line because my history teacher in high school was a great mentor to me and had always said, you know, you can do big things and 
you're you're well traveled. You know, you know all of this, so you should do international relations. I did a program at Georgetown in the summer in high school that was all international relations. All around doing international relations. I get to William and Mary, and you know, I think you've probably experienced this dynamic potentially, but being at the top of your class in high school and being a top performer and top student, you're like, oh wow, I'm a rock star, I can do whatever I want. When you get to William and Mary, it's like, whoa, everyone around me is me. You know, everyone's the same, rock stars, brilliant, like want to do astronomical things. And so I was like kind of, not humbled, but almost like scared. I was like, whoa, these people are really smart. Mm -hmm. I don't think I'm as smart as they are. I think they're smarter than me. I don't know if I can do international relations. So I got a little like timid and kind of mm -hmm. shied away from it. So I didn't do international relations and I ended up going more like history. Mm -hmm. I was like, well, I think I like history because Mr. Averill, my teacher, he was a history teacher. He was great. I can do that. And then I kind of switched again. I was like, well, I don't know if I want to do history either. And I sort of just was like, I have no idea what I want to do. So I took a step back and thought like, let's really think about this. What, what is my ultimate goal here? Like, what do I want to do after college? Mm -hmm. So I thought I wanted to do law. And I was like, okay, I'm going to do economics then. That's the number one major. Let's do that. So I ended up going the economics route in the end. But it took me probably like two, maybe like halfway through my junior year to like realize that. Okay. Which is, I mean, for William and Mary kids, I feel like everybody goes in being like, I'm doing biology. I'm going to be this. I'm going to do this. And I thought I knew, but then... Obviously, I was a little lost puppy and was just like, I have no idea what I want to do. So, Well, you know, I've actually heard a surprising number of people say that exact thing. I think there is this perception that people know and they go straight through with that thing. But actually, a large number of the people I've interviewed, at least, have had that okay, kind of bouncing around, trying to figure out what exactly it is they want to do long term. Yeah. So I'm not the only, no. only lost <laughs> No, no. Um, so economics, you landed on that path. Were there any, and this actually goes for outside economics too, but were there any professors, mentors, advisors that stood out as particularly impactful during your time at William & Mary? So, you know, undergrad, not really. Mm -hmm. Like I felt like I was kind of lost and I, maybe it was part of my fault. Like I didn't go to anyone for help. I kind of was like, oh, I need to figure this out on my own. I'm independent, I can do this. So I really didn't have any, I mean, I liked my professors, mm -hmm. and all, but I really didn't have like one that stood out to me or any mentors. Um, I will say my freshman year, I did take this freshman seminar, because um, you're forced to take, I don't know, there's like 10 to 15 kids in it or something. Mm -hmm. That seminar, I think, changed just everything about the way that I think about words and writing, and it made me probably a 10 times better writer. I don't remember the professor at the time, but I just remember even today, like she really, whatever she did, like really helped me think about writing. And when you're writing something, like what are you really trying to say? What are the words you're trying to use? Mm -hmm. And so to me, she's one that stood out for sure because it just really impacted me. But in economics, <laughs> not, not so much, no. That makes sense. Um, were there any individuals you came into contact with kind of outside the academic sphere that were impactful, either through your sorority or other things you were involved in? Um, so actually, yes, there was one person. So think about this for a moment. How can I frame this? Um, so my sorority obviously was impactful. I had great friends and mm -hmm. girls in that group. And I will say my roommate, Renee, she was very inspiring to me. So she studied abroad mm -hmm. um, her sophomore year, which was unusual. She went down to Chile. Um, and I saw a lot of people studying abroad and there were girls in the classes above me in my sorority who all studied abroad. And I thought, wow, that's really cool that they're doing this. And there was one girl in particular that I talked to about it. And I think she just sort of was like, do it. Like, what do you have to lose? It's fun. It's You learn more out of the classroom than anything, so you should try it. And so then I went to the Reeve Center mm -hmm. to talk to people about it. And I talked to a ton of people. And I just felt like the more and more I talked to people, they were like, why are, why are you still asking about this? Just do it. Mm -hmm. So then I talked to my parents about it. My parents were like, no, we're not, we don't want you to do that. You know, it, the timing, it's like mm -hmm. right after yeah. 2001. Um, September 11th, and they're like, it's just not really a safe world right now. I don't think you should do this. So I was like, well, I'm going to. So this is happening. Um, so I ended up studying abroad. And so I would say those people that I talked to, just that one piece of information mm -hmm. about studying abroad and just seeing people overseas doing that was impactful to me, too. Yeah. Yeah, it sounds like you got a lot of support, at least from the campus. About Correct, yes. And even one of the advisors in the Reeves Center, when I was like, well, my parents aren't really supportive, so how am I going to pay for this if they don't pay for it? She was like, oh, we can help you. We'll find financing. You can take out a loan, and you could, if this is something you really want to do, I mean, you're an adult. You're over 18. You can do this. So I told my parents that 
I was like, you know, I'm going, whether you like it or not. So like, be supportive. Mm -hmm. In the end, they came around. Mm -hmm. They were supportive. So I ended up going to Spain for my second half of my junior year. Great. And will you expand on that experience studying abroad a little bit? Yes. So I loved it. I had a blast. I was there from, so that was 2006. Mm -hmm. I was there from January to May. So I was there for a full five months. And it was just, it was awesome. I took economics courses over there. I took business classes, mm -hmm. um, international business. I met a lot of Americans, I met a lot of other people. My roommate over there, actually, that we were paired with, she was from Clemson, mm -hmm. um, and we had the exact same birthday, November 4th, 1985. How does that So we were like, we are meant to be. And we were pretty, we were best friends, still friends today. Um, and we traveled all over, so we had like a two and a half week spring break when mm -hmm. we were over there. So we went all over. We went to Italy and did this whole tour through Italy, we went to France and traveled all through there. It was so, it was just like backpacking and broke and taking trains and boats overnight and sleeping on trains and it was fun. I would say that was probably one of the best experiences that I had at William & Mary, not just because it was like learning so much that you would not get at William & Mary mm -hmm. in terms of the culture, the experiences. Um, one example, we were supposed to go to Paris for a weekend. We're like, oh, we're gonna just take the train up to Paris and maybe we'll make a long weekend of it and all that. Well, there were riots going on, mm -hmm. like train workers just decided, oh, we don't want to work today and we're going to riot for the next couple of weeks. So we couldn't go. We're like, well, we can't take a train. We don't know how we're going to get there. So it was little things like that that you're just thinking, okay, that doesn't really happen in Williamsburg, Virginia. So this sure. is a, a new experience. Yeah, definitely learning how to navigate between countries too, I think, oh, yes. in a foreign location, even if it is westernized, definitely. Exactly. Yep. And just the, the little things like that I even still do today, I feel like, that kind of shaped me. So in Europe, they buy food like just for the day. Mm -hmm. They'll go to the store and be like, oh, this is all I need. And that's exactly how I am still. You know, I'll just go to the store after work and buy what I need for dinner. It helps that we live right next to the grocery store, so I just walk over there. I don't know if I had to drive every day, I would do that. But I just feel like it's little things that have still kind of stuck with me that shaped my like adult life. Sure, great. So in addition to studying abroad, do you have any specific favorite memories from your time at William & Mary that you want to talk about? Yeah. So. I, like I said, I lived with my roommate mm -hmm. all four years. Um, I think some of my favorite memories in the last, my senior year in 2006 to 2007, we lived off campus in this house that's like right across from, I don't that big field that I'm trying to, and like Barrett, it was right across there. It was on okay, Griffin yeah. Avenue mm -hmm. and it was this little blue house and it was like dubbed the blue monkey. So, so we lived in that house. Um, which I would say that was all one of my favorite memories, just living off campus and enjoying that. Um, you know, joining a sorority, there's always kind of formals and events going on, which is needed in Williamsburg sometimes just to keep you busy. Um, so I would say those were always my favorite memories, just hanging out with my sorority sisters and doing that. I mean, they all kind of blur together. I'm like thinking every sure. formal. Um, and then, you know, fraternities, they would have events too. Mm -hmm. So there was like Sigma Chi Derby Days. I always remember that every year and how fun that was. Um, I'm trying to think other, I mean, most of my time there revolved around those like social events and campus sure. events. Um, so those were probably favorite memories. Um, by grad time, I could talk a little bit about that too, huh? just favorite memories from grad yeah. school. Same thing, so my husband and I went to grad school together so we lived together during grad school and just going through those kind of tough times in business school together. I think those are things that we still talk about and having those memories. Mm -hmm. um, and you go back to, I was thinking about professors and mentors, now I'm like thinking more memories around that. Business school, I definitely had great professors and mentors. And I will say maybe that's because I was a little bit more focused, mm -hmm. like I knew what I was doing there. Like I knew I was on a career path and I knew I had an end goal in mind so I wasn't quite as lost maybe. Yeah. Um, but definitely had strong and fond memories of, of business school for sure. Um, and mentors, and I know in business school you're also assigned an executive coach at the time. And so my coach was phenomenal. Mm -hmm. I mean he really was guiding me in the right direction. It's how, kind of how I ended up where I am today was because of him. So I know I kind of rambled on that no, one. But no, that's perfectly fine. Actually, part of what I want to talk about is just kind of the differences between the undergraduate experience at William Mary and your graduate experience at William Mary and what kind of differences and how different it felt to be in those two kind of roles. So yeah, that it was very, I would say it was a very different dynamic. Mm -hmm. um, 
also just from a maturity standpoint, I think that's what I'm getting at with like being lost versus focused. Oh. I think in undergrad, maybe everybody feels a little lost. You're also, it's also the first time where you're kind of experiencing something new on your own, away from family, away from parents. You're kind of forming these relationships that, you know, you don't know these people very well. You don't know, you're just you're kind of on your own, mm -hmm. you know? And I think undergrad was actually probably like a pretty hard time for me, to be honest. Mm -hmm. I actually liked my graduate experience better okay. because I felt focused. I was like, oh, I know what I'm doing. I have an objective in mind. I'm also I'm very type A, so I like to plan and I like to know what's going on. So undergrad not knowing and just kind of constantly being anxious, I felt like. Sure. Um, so that those are kind of the dynamics I see. Yeah. I, I keep going back to just like unfocused versus focused, mature, not mature. I think those are the key, yeah. key differences for me. Sure, sure, that makes sense. Um, so, well, I always like to ask, what in the Williamsburg area? So I know you said a lot of your social life revolved around kind of um, your sororities or the different social events going on there, but what in the Williamsburg area did you and your friends like to go do for fun or restaurants you like to frequent or anything like that? Yes. So I didn't even think about like bringing up Williamsburg. Williamsburg is a great place for college town. I loved it there. Um, it's funny because I tell people, like my brother went to JMU, and so mm -hmm. whenever I talk to people like, oh, you went to William & Mary, did you turn butter in your free time? It's like, no, I did not go turn butter. But we did love to run down Dog Street. Yeah. So when the weather was nice, we would always just take runs and go down all the way, because it's, I guess, a mile mm -hmm. right down and then mile back, so that was always a perfect run. And from the Kappa house, because Kappa's right there at the top of the route, mm -hmm. it was just perfect. Um, and Kappa also had this great little garden out there that I always used to sit in. I loved that garden. So another favorite memory, just yeah. sitting out there and kind of enjoying the sun or anything. Um, so yeah, so running. Also some restaurants there that we really liked. Uh, the Blue Talon. Mm -hmm. I loved going there. Cheese shop. Oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. Every time I go to Williamsburg, got to get that uh, house dressing. That taste is just can't replicate it. There's nothing like it. <laughs> no, <laughs> exactly. Um, and then same with grad school. I mean, we would go to the cheese shop all the time. Also, we were very broke, I feel like, during grad school. So we would go there just because it's pretty inexpensive mm -hmm. and filling. And then we would also go to, um, I think it's called Plaza Azteca. Is that still yeah. there? It was like the Mexican place down on... Uh, yeah, it's on Richmond, right? Yes, yeah. yep. That was not there in my undergrad time. I remember going to Chili's in undergrad a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's probably still there too, um, but yes, I love the Mexican restaurant there. Great, yeah, that's a lot of fun. I do like the cheese shop in particular, as you might imagine, does come up very frequently throughout the decades. So, um, oh, and one more thing, yeah, absolutely. I'll elaborate. So, um, my husband and I actually ended up getting married at William Mary. I can't okay. believe I haven't brought this up as like a favorite memory. Uh, we got married in the Wren Chapel, okay. and then we had our reception at Ford's Colony. And then we had a rehearsal dinner at the Williamsburg Inn. Wow. So that's another like favorite place of mine. Mm -hmm. um, I never really went there in undergrad though, just because I think you know it is expensive. It's a different like I would see it, but we never went in there or anything. Mm -hmm. So grad school, we went there quite a bit and had you know cocktails in there. I think again, I think maybe it goes to the maturity thing. Mm -hmm. Like we were grown ups, we could do this, and then ended up getting having our rehearsal dinner there and wow. all of that. So yeah, that is a good memory. So you met your husband on during your undergrad. I met him actually after undergrad. Okay. So we were both working in Richmond. He's also from Richmond, okay. grew up, raised there. Um, so we met in Richmond after I was working as a paralegal because I thought I wanted to go to law school. Mm -hmm. So I was like, well, I'm gonna work as a paralegal, make sure I wanna do this. And we were out and about one night and I was with some coworkers and he was with coworkers and he had on a William & Mary hat. It's like this green tribe hat and I was like, oh, he went to William and Mary. I can't believe I haven't seen this person. He looks familiar, maybe. So then we just started talking, and he graduated undergrad in 2005. Okay. So we did overlap for two years, but I mean, I didn't know him, which was very surprising. You yeah. think like you'd kind of see people or recognize them? Um, so yeah. So we met after, and we met in 2009, I think, or 2008, 2008 or 2009, somewhere in there. Um, and then, yeah, the yeah. rest is. Is history. Yeah, but you had that William and Mary connection. And it, so. it, exactly. It's funny because we talk about had he not been wearing that hat that night, I probably wouldn't have. I mean, maybe I would have talked to him, but it was the hat that was like, oh, he went to William and Mary. I should talk to him. Mm -hmm. So we always 
kind of laugh, like William and Mary truly is like what brought us together. Yeah, it's that network at work. Exactly. Um, well, that's great. That's a great story. And it's kind of common, actually. I mean, I'm sure it is. I say this. I'm sure it is with most colleges. People meet their significant others there. But I have to say with William Mary, it feels particularly like that happened. It does. A lot. I agree. With William Mary. So something about it. Yeah, something about the, the William and Mary air and water. <laughs> so um, transitioning a little bit to things that were going on from a sociopolitical perspective um, in the nation and broader world while you were at college, because I know, you know, colleges are a microcosm of the broader <laughs> world, and so you oftentimes see what's happening in the world play out on college campuses. You went at a really interesting time, really close to 9-11 um, occurring, and that shaped, it sounds like, a lot of your experience, but also during the time you were there um, we had a presidential election hurricane katrina hit i mean there were just a bunch of different things going on um, outside of the college and i wonder how you saw that play out on the college campus yeah for sure so i felt like because when i was trying to think back to that time mm -hmm. and like think about what was going on because i know that was in some of the questions you had sent mm -hmm. maybe one thing to think about and so I started to think about it, and like I said, the things that stand out to me were September 11th. Mm -hmm. You mentioned Hurricane Katrina, which I kind of remember. I mean, I know it was happening in the news, but it felt just kind of so far removed that I wasn't as heavily involved. And, um, and then obviously, like, after college, 2008, 2009 was the big recession hit. Mm -hmm. So I felt like I was in this weird kind of time frame where maybe, like, a lot was going on, but nothing really you know kind of hit home for me and maybe because I was in this like little bubble mm -hmm. at William and Mary I felt like and I was in my sorority and kind of wrapped up in other things and I was studying economics and I was very interested in kind of the international aspect and I was so focused on like doing good and mm -hmm. helping that I was I think looking at other things and not really kind of paying attention to what was happening in the world to be honest which I don't for better or for worse, I don't know if that was the best thing, but um, another thing that does stand out to me uh, in 2007, I remember being in the um, like career center, or I'm not even sure what it's called anymore, but there's like little food underneath. It was like that main place where you get your mail. Oh, yeah, the Sadler Center? Yes, I think it had or a Or it was the UC at the yes, time. Yes, yeah. th that's it, the UC. I remember being in there and walking through, and they had the little TV screens up there, and that Virginia Tech shooting had just happened. and. At the time, like, we didn't have any, you know, like, rules or regulations or, like, what do you do? You see this and you're like, oh, my gosh. Like, so they just kind of shut the doors like everybody, like, I'm getting, like, emotional because I still remember it, you know? Like, it was bad. Mm -hmm. So anyway, like, again, we didn't have any rules or regulations around it. It was just, like, they shut the doors. They're like, okay, nobody move. Stay right where you are. Mm -hmm. And everybody's like, okay, is something going on, like, here? Mm -hmm. Are people being shot at? Like, what do we do? Sure. So that was something that just like still kind of stands out. Yeah. And obviously like still impacts me. Well, it's tough as a Virginian too. I think that hit so close to yeah. home. Um, My stepdad went to tech too. Yeah. 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 yeah um, Cookies. I yep. know. <laughs> They're everywhere. There are a lot they of Hercules really in Williamsburg too. But do you remember then things shifting, like um, regulation shifting on campus as a result of that? I think for the first time, at least for Virginia, that was, um, it just woke up Virginia to this really thing did. that really could happen. And I, I like to hear how people saw that play out on different campuses. So do you remember? So I don't remember anything happening, like, okay. initially, to be honest. Sure. And obviously, like, with what's still happening, I don't think anything's changing. Mm -hmm. And, like, it's crazy that that was 11 years ago. Yeah. So, no, I mean, and I didn't notice anything right away either. Sure. Like, like I said, they shut the doors and they told us not to move and they told us to just sit in there. Mm -hmm. But after that, it was like, okay, like we remember and we're going to do a vigil and all this. But then it just sort of went back to like normal mm -hmm. campus. No one brought it, like, again, no one was like, what, what do we do to plan for this, sure. prepare? So I don't know, like, like I said, to this day, I don't know if anything's happening mm -hmm. or still, so, yeah. Yeah, that's helpful insight. There, there was that initial shock factor, but yeah. Right, it's exactly. It's a good question. What comes long term from things like that it, happening in close proximity. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And it's just something to think about with William and Mary should be prepared for something like that because you have such like open spaces like the Sunken Gardens. I mean something like that could easily mm. transpire. And yeah. you just never know. So mm. yes, but that is one thing I do remember. Sure. That absolutely. obviously hit home for me and mm -hmm. had a very big impact. And even I think that's why I get so emotional is because it's still happening. 
Absolutely. Um, and, you know, I know we're kind of on a hard line of questions that are difficult to recall, but um, sort of along those lines, things that happened on college campuses, things that were impactful on William & Mary's campus. So one thing I'm thinking about is um, sexual harassment and assault. Uh, obviously, it's been going on for as long as you know, college campuses have existed, but at the time you were at school, it was you know, somewhat frequently talked about. It was pretty openly talked about, at least in um, publications like the Flat Hat, and I yep. wonder if that was something there was a general awareness or discussion about happening on campus. I think so. I mean, I don't really remember that, to be honest. I mean, I know obviously it is prevalent. It was happening at college campus. I don't think it was quite as talked about and prevalent as it is today, mm -hmm. especially with like the Me Too and Time's Up and all that. So I'm glad to see it's coming to light. And to be honest, I never experienced that. Mm -hmm. So I haven't, I don't have much, you know, on that topic. Yeah. No, that's fine. I like to ask just in case there was some sphere that maybe that was discussed. And but yeah, maybe. No, I mean, I think it it was happening. Mm -hmm. Like you said, I think it probably was something that was talked about. But at least in my circles, mm -hmm. I didn't, you know, experience any of that. Okay. Um, and so another thing that happened yep. that was pretty tumultuous because you went at a very tumultuous time <laughs> is right. So Jean Nickel was president during. I guess your senior yep. year. Um, do you remember any of the controversy kind of swirling or surrounding that or what that was like um, during that year? A little bit, but at the same time, it was my senior year, yes. so I was kind of like out the door. Uh -huh. I was like, okay, I'm prepping to get out of here. So I do remember the controversy a little bit, but I don't even know like what the controversy was mm -hmm. other than I remember there was one controversy around the Wren Chapel, and I think like whether there was a cross in there or something. And I mean, again, I was like, I. Yeah. I'm not really, I'm kind of open to whatever people want to do. If mm -hmm. you want to put a cross in there, if you don't, if you want to put whatever, like to me, the Red Chapel is just kind of a place of prayer and get away. So that was one piece I remember, and I didn't really have much to say on that. And then Jean Nickel, again, like I kind of was indifferent. I was mm -hmm. like, okay, well, I'm leaving. Yeah. I mean, I get the legacy part, and we want to have a good president, but, you know, I was so focused on getting a job, I think, at that point, sure. and like my own career that I was not really too worried. Yeah. Well, do you have any particular memories then about um, Tim Sullivan, who was there before? So I like to ask it, William and Mary students in particular because there is somewhat of a closer proximity just to the presidents than maybe some larger schools. Exactly. So do you have any memories specifically of Tim Sullivan? I just know that everybody loved him. I mean, it was like, I think that's part of the controversy mm -hmm. was he was so well liked and so well loved and everybody talked about him to then when he's leaving, of course, if someone's so well liked and loved, and every the student body loves him, of course, it's going to be a controversy when someone new comes in, regardless of who it is. It's like, okay, well, it's not Tim Sullivan, so, yeah. Um, so that's all I remember him just being very like well loved by the student body and everybody wanting to be, you know, with him and doing. I think he was very involved in things, and so I don't know if I ever met him though. I can't really like recall. So I don't. Yeah. Okay. Um, so before we transition to your time, well, after William Mary, before coming back to William and Mary, um, <laughs> are there any other difficult or challenging experiences you had while you were a student, um, be they social or academic, anything like that, or any ways you felt um, particularly supported or not supported during your time at William and Mary? Yeah. So like I, I kind of continue talking, like I just felt like I was lost and like very, not on my own because I'm sure there was a support network if I wanted one, but I think I just felt like I could do it. Like, I can solve all the problems I need to do on my own. I don't need anybody. I have my friends. I can talk to them. Um, so I think for me that was, like, exactly, you know, I felt like I was just on my own a lot. Um, so, like, I did have good time, obviously. I learned a lot. I had good memories, fond times. Um, but I also remember hard times. Like, I didn't know, like, We've talked about uh, my major. Mm -hmm. I did feel lost a lot. Like, what am I going to do after this? Where am I going? Um, I think also because you're meeting new people and you're constantly changing. So you move. I moved from Dupont Hall, then my sophomore year, I think I went to Jefferson mm -hmm. Hall. Then my junior year, I moved to the Kappa House. And sophomore year, we moved off campus. So it's constantly like changing. You're going from one year to the next. You feel like the time flies by when you're there. You're just like, oh my gosh, how is it over already? Um, I think the friends that you live with, you obviously become very close with, but I find it interesting that the friends that I lived with, I'm actually not as close with 
today mm -hmm. to my best girlfriends that I keep in touch with were people, were girls in my sorority that I actually maybe wasn't as close with. Mm -hmm. So I think that that, that dynamic is also just interesting. And I, maybe it's like life stages that you're going through. So like I got married, my other girlfriend was getting married. So we were kind of in the same stages of life and maybe that's why we've remained so close. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think it's everybody's kind of finding themselves, mm -hmm. which is, you know, it's hard sometimes. Yeah. And I wonder if I hadn't joined a sorority, what that would have been like. Mm -hmm. I think I would have had totally different friends. Mm -hmm. I think it may have been, I don't want to say a better experience because I loved my experience with my sorority sisters, but I think it could have been maybe more helpful mm -hmm. because I think a sorority, you, not that it's superficial, I hate using that word, mm -hmm. but you know, people say like, oh, you're buying your friends which when you're new to something, maybe you need that. You need a sorority to kind of like help guide you and find your friends. But at the same time, I could see how maybe I could have found a smaller group of friends who would have been more helpful and beneficial. And I know I mentioned kind of the like eye-opening piece about the wealth and money at William & Mary. For me, like I didn't come from that. I came from a very middle-class background. So I think sororities kind of maybe do come from that wealthier background. And so for me too, I felt like, I don't really fit in here sometimes like I don't know and it opened my eyes to there's finance like if you want to go that route it, there's so much money in that world if you become like a finance person or an investment banker or hedge fund manager terms like in undergrad I did not even know existed I was like what is a hedge fund what does that even mean I have no idea so that's where I think again I was just sort of I, my eyes were open to so many things that I was like, oh my gosh, like I don't even know what I'm doing. I don't, I have no idea. Mm -hmm. So I know that was a long winded, rambled answer um, about my undergrad experience and difficult moments, but I think I just was trying to find who I was. Definitely. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, I think that's the case with a lot of college students. It's a weird time that can't be replicated. It's a very interesting type of time in a very specific place. and. Yeah, it, it really is. It's yeah. And so I just I kind of wonder the different um, paths that can go down. Like sure. had I not joined a sort like I mentioned, if I would have had a smaller group of friends, how would that have panned out? Would I have maybe found myself a little bit sooner? Because I think I didn't find myself until after mm -hmm. college where I really was like, OK, I know what I'm doing. I don't want to be a lawyer. I'm not doing this. I'm going to business school. I want to be a business person. Yeah. So I think there's just those dynamics and um, I don't know, I just wonder. Yeah. Are there other things like that you, when you think back on this, that you would have gotten involved with um, had you chosen a different path? I think I, I lacked a lot of confidence too, mm -hmm. I think. So exactly, I think you hit it there. Like I would have joined maybe more clubs. I would have been more active in things, like joined sports. I just didn't, I kind of stuck to myself mm -hmm. too. I was like, oh, I'm a runner. I'm going to go running, which is a very independent thing mm -hmm. to do. Um, I think also I mentioned it before, I was kind of timid. I was scared. I was like, okay, I'm not as smart as these people. So I didn't join clubs because I was like, well, I don't really know if I should be doing that. I don't know, uh, which is something that was so opposite in high school. Mm -hmm. I mean, in high school, I was like the president of the class. I was the president of the Spanish club. Like I did everything to go from everything to then I think I just got too intimidated by people, which I, I can't believe I let that happen. But something about the, that like, time right after high school where you're finding yourself mm -hmm. and you just feel like everyone around you you know is maybe smarter mm -hmm. I think that intimidated me so I did not get involved in a lot and I kind of not that I regret that but I wish I would have had just the courage to do that for sure okay. that's, an, that's really interesting this idea that whatever your identity was in high school if you come and everybody else also had that identity it actually leads you into kind exactly. of a yeah. yeah search for where you fit then Exactly. I think you hit the nail on the head. I didn't really know my identity mm -hmm. or who I was. And so I just kind of stuck to myself. I didn't seek out mentors. I probably should have done all of that. I think that probably would have been more helpful to have someone kind of guide me. Mm -hmm. be like, you should do this. You should do this. Versus like, oh, you can do whatever you want. You can be whoever you want. I Sometimes I find that that's hard. Sometimes you just need a little guidance. Too many options. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and when the world's your oyster, you're like, oh, the world's my oyster. I can do what I want. But at the same time, I don't even know who I am. So how am I supposed to do this? <laughs> oh, oh my goodness. So let's transition then to post, you know, undergrad where you do start to figure that out, like what your identity is. You said you were on the law track. And yep. then, so can you walk me through like graduation and where you saw yourself going and then how that changed? Sure. So graduation, I had a job lined up. I was going to be working as a litigation paralegal mm -hmm. for a law firm in Richmond. They're called Williams Mullen. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and that was sort of my plan, like, okay, here I go. I'm gonna go to law school in a couple of years. Um, I joined that team and my boss at the time, uh, he was great, great mentor. I mean, he was a litigator, so you gotta balance that. Maybe not the nicest person in the courtroom or in general, but for some reason to me, he, you know, took up a liking and he was a great mentor to me. Mm -hmm. um, the paralegal, they kind of hired us like in classes, I guess. So there were three paralegals ahead of me and then three of us came in. The one paralegal ahead of me went to William & Mary. She went to my high school. We had the exact same like background and demographic, mm -hmm. like everything just, we were the same person essentially. Um, and so she and I became obviously really good friends working there. All the paralegals, we kind of bonded. Um, and had fun, and actually those are the ones that I was you know, out with when I met my husband. Mm -hmm. um, so ended up working there for two years, and at the end of the two, I say like end of the two years, because that was kind of the typical, like be a paralegal for two years, go to law school, that was like the, the rotation. Mm -hmm. um, but I decided I didn't think I wanted to do that. So then again, I'm like, oh no, what do I do? But I went to my litigator, who my mentor, and I just asked him, you know, what do you think I should do? Because I don't know if I want to do law school and the 2008, 2009 recession had hit. That kind of like whole big Lehman Brothers falling. Everyone's applying to law school because they don't know what to do either. So I was like, okay, I don't know if I wanna to go to law school. I, I think I'm just doing this because this has always been like the path I decided on. Um, I also don't wanna be going with everybody at this time. Like this just doesn't seem right. And he's the one that was like, I think you should go to business school. Maybe apply to business school instead and see what happens or apply to both, mm -hmm. law school and business school. So that's what I did. I applied to both. I was like, I'll just apply and see what happens. And I decided William & Mary Business School because they were great enough to provide a lot of scholarship money. And I was like, well, if I can go for pretty cheap, I think this is a great path. Um, so I ended up going back and that kind of helped. That's what formed and shaped why I went back and kind of life after, after graduation. Sure. And so when business school was being recommended, I mean, did you have an idea of what you wanted to do in business or did that develop kind of more in business school? So I think I knew I wanted to do consulting of some kind because um, that was another piece of, so working at this law firm, they did this pro bono work on the side for immigration law. Mm -hmm. And I saw working with USCIS and customs and kind of helping immigrants through the process, how just inefficient it was mm -hmm. and how long it takes and it was all paper based and I'm like this is 2007 2008 why are we still like mailing things in we have the internet we can do this so I just saw how things didn't work right and I, I as I talked to people about it they're like well that's consulting you know you're fixing problems you should probably look into consulting and my coach the executive coach I mentioned he did human capital consulting and like leadership development and executive coaching and when he told me about what he did I was like that sounds really cool I think I want to do something like that um, and then I just kind of realized like okay I need to make connections I need to start networking I'm gonna talk to people so I went I thought the Career Center at least for me in grad school mm -hmm. I just felt they were more supportive and like very helpful and wanted me to succeed and I'm sure undergrad would have been the same way had I gone to them but at the same time like I said I just didn't know what I wanted to do so how can I go and seek help when I don't know where I want to go yeah. um, and so that's again they helped me they guided me they put me in touch with the right connections um, it was so I remember talking to this guy Jim Hagee at Deloitte and Jackie Winters at Deloitte and I remember those names because they're the ones that kind of helped me get in the door interviewed me talked to me got me in and then I ended up at Deloitte and I talked to them after Jackie and I you know stayed in touch um, I don't, and I'm still in touch with them on LinkedIn and everything, but I mean, it was exactly, it was, those, it was William and Mary, those business school connections that kind of got me on my path today and led me where I am. Sure. So let's talk about post Deloitte then. So you went to sure. Deloitte. Um, how was your experience there? Deloitte was great. Mm -hmm. So I was with Deloitte for nearly five years. Um, I, yes, gosh, that, I'm just thinking, I'm like five years, where did that time go? Um, so I joined Deloitte in November of 2000. No, I got my offer in 2011. Um, but then I joined in July of 2012. And so that time uh, they wanted me in the DC office because mm -hmm. that's where I was, uh, William and Mary is obviously close to the DC office. That's where I was recruited out of. And that was kind of my whole thing. Oh, I'm really excited to go to DC and work on the federal side because I worked with USCIS in a previous life. So this is exciting. Mm -hmm. um, and then Andrew, my husband proposed and he was going to Atlanta. So I 
was like, oh, okay, I can't go to D.C. if my fiancé is moving to Atlanta. So I talked to Deloitte. I was like, you know, I need to be in Atlanta if that's okay. And that was totally fine with them. They were like, yep, you can go down to Atlanta. Not a problem. Just work for us down there. So I ended up down in Atlanta and worked for um, the CDC, Center for Disease Control, as my client down there for the mm -hmm. five years. And that was just a phenomenal experience. And then you talk about William & Mary down there. There's, That's how I met my best friend today. Her name's Anne. We met at a William & Mary alumni event. Mm -hmm. I mean, that exactly. It's those connections that keep things going. There's another woman, I think she's actually here this weekend, Brooke. Mm -hmm. um, another great connection that we have. So I think William & Mary just transpires itself in all the cities that you know we've lived in. Now we're in Milwaukee, so I can go like post Deloitte. Um, yeah. Now we've moved and we're up here in the Midwest um, in Milwaukee. And yeah, so I think that's, you know, it's been amazing, but I think now I'm with a different company and William and Mary again, I think is the one that kind of got me in the door with that company. Mm -hmm. That was the first thing they said was like, we noticed you with William and Mary. I'm like, well, how did you notice that here in the Midwest? They're like, well, we know it's, you know, East Coast and really good. I'm like, oh, okay. Great. <laughs> so that's a great reputation to have. So I think William and Mary has just helped me throughout my entire, you know, career here. Sure. So I really, I'm thankful for that. Yeah, definitely. Do you want to talk a little bit just about what your position is now and what you do? Sure. So now I am at SC Johnson, which is based in Racine, Wisconsin, which is a little bit outside of Milwaukee, so it's south about like 30 minutes or so. Okay. Um, and I am doing, I am the, my official title, it's really long, but I am the manager for talent management and culture for the North America region, mm -hmm. which that is a mouthful. Um, but basically I do just HR internal mm -hmm. consulting for them. I do a lot of their leadership development, performance management, and things that I was doing outside, like as an external consultant for CDC and Coca-Cola in the past. So honestly, if someone would have asked me 10 years ago when I graduated William & Mary, like if they would have said one day you're gonna be living in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, I would have been like, oh, no, you're out of your mind. You must be crazy. I don't even know where Milwaukee, Wisconsin is. I had to look it up on the map. Uh, when Andrew told me, he's like, oh, by the way, I got this opportunity in Milwaukee. It's like, okay, where? <laughs> like, where is that? <laughs> Having grown up, you know, on the East Coast my entire life, mm -hmm. I had all these different perceptions of Wisconsin and Milwaukee and what it is. Um, so, yes, I constantly think about that. Just in 2007 when I graduated, looking at where I am and how I've been and how I've gotten here, I would have just been like, no, you're out of your mind. I, there's no way I'll be living in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. What would take me up that way? Um, but I'm honestly my dream role. This is exactly like five years ago at Deloitte, if someone would have said, where do you want to be in seven years? I'd be like, oh, I think I want to do in internal consulting for a big company. And I want to be like in HR and one day like an executive for HR and all that. And I think that's actually like kind of like going. It's working that that way so awesome yeah that's great and it sounds like you've listed a couple of ways already that your William Mary ha experience has paid off um, and played out in different ways getting you to this point it really has and the connections that mm -hmm. I've made and just I think people once you graduate I think people are very excited to help you I mean when you reach out to an alumni and just say like oh I'm a William Mary grad looking at this I'm interested like I noticed in business school that was one thing where I think I finally had the courage and the gumption to be like, so what if I reach out? What if they say no? That the worst they're going to do is either not respond or they're not going to want to meet with me, So, or they are. So what's the, what's the harm? Yeah. So I just finally just started shooting out emails, being like, I'd love to pick your brain on this. I just want to interview you, like informational interview. And I think people are happy to help. They want to talk about it. They want to talk about their jobs. Mm -hmm. You know, They want to talk about what they did in the past. And I think women marry people in general are mm -hmm. even like, I don't know, more so willing to do that for sure. So I think that's what helped me because I would just talk to people and pick their brain on everything. And then when we moved to Milwaukee, I reached out to the alumni center at the business school and talked to a couple of people and I'm asking, you know, like, do we have a group up here? Do we have an alumni group? Mm -hmm. We don't, we have like 10 people, but uh -huh. that's okay. You know, we can start small and maybe form one. Mm -hmm. um, but. Exactly. So I think people want to connect people and they want to help. And I've noticed that a lot like post-graduation, just how helpful it's been. Great. So you've mentioned a couple of times that you've connected in with alumni networks in any given place like yep. Atlanta or searched for one at least in Milwaukee. So um, that's obviously a way you've kind of stayed involved with William & Mary since you graduated. But are there any other ways that you've remained involved? So I'm trying to think. The alumni network mm -hmm. is definitely 
the, the main way. Um, I try to get back to campus whenever I can. I know there's events and things and like homecoming. I try to get back. My tenure was this past year, so 2017. We couldn't go just because mm -hmm. we had moved to Wisconsin. Yeah. And I was like, oh, we just moved. We were getting settled. Unfortunately, like I'm just not going to be able to. And there's no nonstop flights. Anyway, random tangent. But it was very difficult to get there for a weekend in October. So we didn't make it. Um, but yeah, anytime there's like events, I know there was an MBA thing that just happened in May. I really wanted to go, but again, I just couldn't get there. So I, I'm definitely on all these distribution lists and try to stay connected. These destination events that we are here for today, mm -hmm. um, definitely part of these. I've, I saw last year they did New York and I think they did DC before. I didn't make it to either one of those, but I try to stay connected and involved wherever possible. And then with Kappa, my sorority, so it's another one. I know it's not technically like William and Mary based, but I'm in the Kappa alumni chapter, mm -hmm. which they do have one in Milwaukee, and I was in the one in Atlanta as well. And so again, my friend Anne, she's also a Kappa, mm -hmm. so that also helps with you know why we are so connected. But again, I, I try to go to the Kappa conferences, or if there's my book clubs, the Kappa book mm -hmm. club. Um, so I try to stay connected and at least meet friends um, through those ways, for sure. Great. So when you return to William Mary, or even through just the news, things you've heard about how William Mary's changed, what changes have you seen or heard about, and what do you think of them? That's a great question. So I'm very in tune with the business school, sure. um, and I know when I was there, maybe the business school rankings weren't as high as they wanted to be, and I know they've been moving up, and they've been doing a really good job of that. Um, and I know that uh, uh, like a big thing for them too, I think that's why they were so engaged and involved and they want people to get jobs and we're so active as, you know, part of the rating is how employed are your people when they mm -hmm. leave. So I think the business school has done a great job of really, you know, helping with that and the rankings. Um, so I've been watching that in the news. I know we have a new president um, woman, saw mm -hmm. her on the cover. I actually didn't know that, I'll admit. I checked the mail yesterday before we left and I had the magazine and I was like, oh yeah. And I did see an interview with her, I think, but I wasn't really following that. And then I was like, oh, we have a female. This is awesome, great. Mm -hmm. um, so that, I did see that. Um, and that, and then just obviously William & Mary's reputation is still very strong. My cousin's there now, okay. so he is a junior and he still says the same thing, like, oh, it's a great school. He's very much, I think, like I was a little lost. He's like, I don't know what I want to do. I think I want to do finance. I think I want to do business. And here I'm trying, I'm like, yes, you should do finance. I think that's great. I'm trying to like point him in the direction, obviously being an advocate for the business school too. Yeah. So he is doing finance. Um, but, you know, so I try to stay connected and through the news I did see the new president. Mm -hmm. um, but that's really, I think being in Wisconsin is hard. Sure. To be honest, a lot of people don't know William & Mary. Um, it's a lot of Northwestern, Chicago, Booth. Uh, Notre Dame is huge, Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to kind of stay connected and hear what's going on when I'm so far removed from it all. Yeah, absolutely. Well, do you have any changes in particular you would like to see happen in William Mary's future? I don't think so, no. Oh, the other thing I have in here is yeah. just go for the bold mm -hmm. campaign. That's huge. And I know, sorry, I totally just no, you're saying things you want to see change for the future. So it made me think money and like okay. giving as much as we can back to the to the college. I know that's important, it is a public school. A lot of people think it's private, but it's not. So we definitely, as alumni, have a, a duty to contribute back, mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah. So I just wanna keep saying that. I know that, that one day, the Bold Campaign, or One Tribe One yeah, Day yeah, one is tribe, huge, mm -hmm. and I would just like to see that continue to grow. I think that's a great campaign that they do every year. Great, great. So considering the year we're in, so 2018 to 2019 is the 100th anniversary of co-education at William Mary. So the 100th yeah. anniversary of women as students at the college. Um, tons of events happening around that. Very exciting time. Very exciting time for us to get the first female president as well. So considering we're about to kick that off, um, can you just speak a little bit about the value and contribution of women as you've seen it play out either at William & Mary or beyond? Sure. Oh, goodness, that's a loaded question. <laughs> um, so I, I think I'll go a couple of ways on this. Um, I'm just thinking. Mm -hmm. So do you want like the value and contribution of William at William and Mary or just like in general? Um, either way you either want to way. go, yeah. Okay. Um, 
I think this is a tough question, mm -hmm. just because I think as I'm thinking through it, women in general, to be honest, have a tougher time, I think, um, with just jobs and getting jobs and negotiating. Um, I, I will go back to my roommate. I think she was very strong, like a very strong woman. Mm -hmm. um, she, went, she studied abroad, like the sophomore year she went to Chile, and I, I found that just very inspiring. I'm like, whoa, she's going this sophomore year and doing this? And she kind of always knew what she wanted. She wanted to do international relations, which I did too at the time. And then I think I got intimidated by her, to be honest. Um, but she was just a very strong leader. And she would go after what she wanted. She knew she wanted to do this, uh, studied abroad, got a job right after college. She moved to New York, like did finance, like lived in New York, this like powerhouse woman. So I think that she was like a great role model to mm -hmm. me, honestly, just to follow kind of like her lead. Be like, wow, Renee is like badass. Um, and I think there are some women out there. And then in my uh, uh, business school times in grad school, there was a professor, I think the women professors that I had were great too. I think that's what, like, I was like, oh, we can do this business. Like, this has been great for me. Um, just to see how, I don't know, like confident and inspiring and that you can do this. Like, mm -hmm. there's no need to be afraid. We can do it too. Um, and I think that also maybe is why like looking back on it, maybe why I didn't go to law school or decided not to do law is because it is such a like male-oriented field, it seems like, and very like outspoken, and you have to do it this way, and you have to be very like assertive in yourself. Um, and not to say the business world's not, it's the same way. But I think at the time for me, I was like, okay, I work with all male litigators. Mm -hmm. I didn't work with a single female. All the paralegals were female. So it was little things like that that just kind of, I think, have twisted me too along the way and showed me like, okay, I don't know if I want to do this because it is male dominated. Um, and female litigators, there were, I think there was like one on the floor mm -hmm. and she was just not, like she just didn't have a good reputation. And I don't know why that is. Is it like, does she not have a good reputation because she's a female or is she not a good lawyer? Like, I don't know, why are we you know, even talking about that? Um, I think another thing just randomly popped into my mind when I was saying that, mm -hmm. uh, but the flight there this is totally random but I was just thinking about women and this came up the flight that Southwest flight that was in flight from I think New York to Dallas that um, the engine blew recently and the pilot safely landed the plane when you listen to the news they say the female pilot safely like, what why why are we even bringing up like female pilot you know it should just be like the pilot safely landed the plane got everyone on the ground did did her job mm -hmm. Like, I don't even understand why it's an, an issue, or like a, not an issue, but a, why it's even brought up, mm -hmm. like this female. Uh, and I think that happens a lot. I think it's happening in the business world every day. I think women have it, have it harder, not to say that like we have a chip on our shoulder, but I think at the same time we kind of do. And I know in some of, since I'm in HR, I see a lot of this for sure. Um, and one thing in particular, um, we have the gender mm -hmm. pay gap that like, for sure stands out. I think another thing is kind of how women present themselves. If a woman is too assertive, she's considered, you know, like a bitch. I, I hate to say that, but it, it comes out. It's like, well, no, she's just being assertive. If a man does it, he's not considered that way. He's like confident and assertive. So I think there's just little things that women are dealing with and it's that, not stereotype, but you know, there, there are things that we have to overcome that men don't even think about. Mm -hmm. And when I was negotiating for my job, I felt bad. I was like, I feel bad asking for more money. Like, this is weird. But my husband was like, why do you feel weird? You have great skills. You worked for Deloitte for five years. You worked for Coca-Cola for two years. Like, you have phenomenal background. Why are you even questioning asking for more money? But I'm just like, but am I worth that? Like, should I be asking mm -hmm. for that? It's like, yes, absolutely. So, you know, in my negotiations, I ended up doing it. Again, I felt bad about it though, which is not how I should be feeling. Mm -hmm. I should be like, no, I'm totally deserving of this. I've worked really hard to get here. This is absolutely the right thing. Um, so I know I took that down a random path. No, I mean, it sounds like, you know, what you're saying is women have to navigate those challenges exactly continually, but they're doing it and they're succeeding in the same ways while still having to navigate all of those challenges. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think it's coming to the forefront, right? Mm -hmm. I think going forward, I think it'll be much more apparent um, that we're facing these challenges and hopefully that won't happen. And I know some of the training that's going on, even like Starbucks is doing it, even our company's thinking about it, this mm -hmm. whole like 
unconscious bias thing, it happens every day. I mean, you can be looking at someone and you're like, oh, I like that person. Why? Oh, because they're like me. Yeah. That's an unconscious bias. And people do that all the time and just like even, you know, performance and all. I'm thinking HR, that's just where my brain is going. But there's that unconscious thing to it. And so same with being a woman. It's like, well, she's a woman. I like her. Or, oh, she's a woman. I don't like her. Mm -hmm. It's the same, same exact thing. But it's definitely, it's coming to the forefront. I think, you know, I hate to say like time's up, but I think women are finally, finally going to have a seat at the table. Yeah. Well, thank you for asking. I know it was a loaded question. <laughs> I kind of just threw that at you right here. At the yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of different ways that can be taken. I mean, it's like William and Mary, yes, women, but also then like kind of career and outside of William and Mary and what's going on. Um, and just women being, you know, CEOs and running the world and that's happening. I mean, there are not many companies where women are at the top, but they're definitely making their way. Yeah. Um, and just there's a whole host of other things around that, but exactly. Yeah. Well, thank you for providing insights on kind of both of those. You're the women you saw at William Mary, but also what you've seen kind of in the broader professional field. Okay. So since we're at the end of the interview, I like to turn it over to you, where you can add just whatever thoughts you had, memories you have, things we haven't covered yet. This is your time to do so. So. Sure. So, yeah. As we were talking, I think I've you know, gotten a lot of memories just kind of sparked, so I just wanted to bring up a couple of things that maybe I didn't cover. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one memory or a couple of memories that stand out to me, I know I've talked about Kappa a lot, but some good memories. We always used to do these philanthropy events like Cappuccino or Capasta or something, and for some reason those just stand out because we're like prepping in the house, getting everything ready, then you're outside in that little courtyard mm -hmm. area. And for some reason, I just remember the weather being good every year. Like we're out there having fun and doing this and you know, the sorority, all the sorority girls on that court come by and then all the like fraternity boys come by. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, I just remember that being like a good, a good memory. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to share that. And then I also, you know, thinking about the weather. I mean, springtime in Williamsburg is amazing. Mm -hmm. I just remember like sitting on the sunken gardens and enjoying the sun and that was always fun to do with friends. Um, one thing I haven't talked about either when we were talking about the time, like being there from 2003 to 2007. So my senior year, the queen came, and that was crazy. And I know we just had the royal wedding, so when I see her on there, I'm like, oh, I saw you. I took pictures of you with a like old school camera because we didn't have iPhones back then or anything. So I had like, I, I remember that too, like taking the camera to events, like yeah. bringing a little, you know, I don't even know what happened to those pictures today. You know, I'm thinking about it, like I know I have my, like very old laptop mm -hmm. that has all the pictures on there and sometimes I'll open it up and I know that every college picture that I ever took is on there and I'll open it up and like scroll through and we used to make those slideshows like on PowerPoint so that you could just see them mm -hmm. but yeah we didn't have iPhones or anything and then um, okay this is totally random but it just made me think of it I was at a session in Chicago two days ago um, talking to Facebook about they were doing some presentation at a conference and they mentioned you know I don't know how many people are in here were joined Facebook when it was the facebook.com that was me I joined it when it was www.thefacebook and it was only William and Mary people like mm -hmm. it was only your college mm -hmm. then it expanded to like other colleges but it was only college kids and now look we're like everybody can be on Facebook yeah. so that just reminded me too of like the times like we didn't have Facebook and I think I joined my sophomore year on Facebook um, yeah and so again it's things like that where we take so much for granted it's like information and people and networks are at our fingertips today it's like back then we didn't have like and also this social media stuff with pictures everywhere mm -hmm. and I'm kind of glad maybe we didn't because who knows what would be out there right but yeah you know so it's little things like that you know and that was just one other thing I wanted to bring up was just mm -hmm. the technology piece and I remember too like when I studied abroad in Spain we had, I had this little phone that was like an international mm -hmm. cell phone, but I could only use it for like a certain amount of time. And so I would tell my parents, I'd be like, okay, I'm gonna call you at you know 9.15, cause I know it's 3.15 your time. So we would like schedule calls. You don't have to do that anymore. Like we have WhatsApp and stuff. So when you travel internationally, it's like you just text like, mm -hmm. oh, I'm fine, I made it. No, I think that's also why my parents were so terrified. It's like, we can't keep in touch with you when you're gone. We can't, you know, we have no idea what you're doing cause you have this international phone that only works for a certain amount of time and I don't remember the rules on it but it was very odd it was like I couldn't just pick it up and call yeah. I had to be like in a certain place and I remember going to like the internet cafes that's like I couldn't post when I wanted to post my pictures I had to like take the sim card thing or the little thing to the internet cafe 
put it in there and then upload them to Facebook. And so then all my friends back home were like, we never see any pictures of you. And I'm like, yeah, because I had to upload them and it's such a process and it takes forever. It's a totally different world. How quickly that's changed too. Yeah. Like you had to get an invite from someone with a college you know, email to join Facebook in the first place. <laughs> exactly. Oh, that is so wild. And yeah, and having to have um, like the, the calling cards, like buying minutes to speak um, on those. Yeah. Exactly. It was well. such a such a different time. such a different time. Yeah, and even just you know phones in general. Like I remember uh, when I was there, like I had just a little flip phone, you know, that just called, mm -hmm. nothing else. And I don't know what the big one was at the time, like the Motorola Razor, I think it was. It was like that slim little yeah. <laughs> silver thing. I'm like, I felt so cool because I'm like, oh, I have the Motorola Razor. It has different ringtones and it can play like the the Sex in the City theme song. I'm so cool. Or like James Bond. Yeah. So anyway, other, those were just things that came to mind that maybe we didn't cover. So yeah, Absolutely. Well, thank you for adding those now. I think those really placed you at a specific moment in time for sure. Um, if there's not anything else at this time, though, we'll go ahead and wrap it up. Okay. All right. Good. Well, thank, thank you, you so much.